Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 03636 59 0703 768 Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. tonight I want to only spend a bit of time because of our space on the gospel the power that emanates from the gospel two passages we left in our study in the morning which I want you to refer back to very quickly you remember that we referred to second timothy chapter 1 we read from verse 8 we read it in the afternoon up to verse 13 i think i would like you to read it again be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That was the passage. And then the second passage, which we are going to be dealing with together tonight, is Romans chapter 1. Romans 1. And one more time, I read verse 14. But this time I will stop in verse 17. I am debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. May God bring increase to his word as we look at it together tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When Timothy was being instructed, it was very, very 
striking. That Paul had to, in, had to instruct Timothy, say, Be thou not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. And what that immediately evokes for me as I look at the scripture is the travail, is the blackmail, the perils that the devil, the prince of this world, had set against the gospel so that it would not be preached. I would like to quickly bring out what I'm saying here. If anybody knows the potency of the gospel. If anybody understands the damage that the gospel will cause the kingdom of darkness whenever it is preached, it is the devil. Whereas he makes some of us and many people to think that the gospel is it's a mere tautology. But he himself, he knows deep down in his heart that the gospel, whenever it is preached, whenever men come to understand the gospel, he sees an immediate downfall of whatever he is doing in the life of men. So in order for the gospel to be hindered, the devil has said so many, many, many things against the gospel. Against the preaching of the gospel. Part of it the first one that the devil set up, I want to just share with you here, is shame. What did I say? Shame. I want all of you to be, let's talk. Do you know that one of the first challenges that confronts you anytime you want to preach the gospel. Even to someone that is junior to you, or someone that is your colleague, is a sudden sense of what? Of shame. As if if you start talking about the gospel now, something is wrong about you. Do you know what happens sometimes when you enter into a meeting? If they are discussing politics, how do you discuss politics? Eh? You talk it freely. I'm sorry they will help you. I cannot. The people that are in charge, they will send you help by the grace of God. Let me continue doing what I can do so that others can do their own. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus Christ. When you are talking politics, you don't have any sense of shame at all. When you take any issue 
in the social strata. You discuss it with boldness. But do you notice that every time there is an urge inside of you to want to preach the gospel, in the same place where you have been freely talking politics or discussing scientific theory, what do you immediately sense? Talk to me. There's a sense of shame. As if, why do you want to spoil the show now? Why do you want to disturb people now? Why do you want to cause confusion now? So you will notice that the first thing that Paul was saying to Timothy was to say, Be thou not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of God. What would be the afflictions of the gospel? The one we are familiar with sometimes is the persecution. Is the fact that people can just stand up and shout you down because you are preaching the gospel. But for me, that itself is very little. The first affliction that I think the devil has devised against the gospel is a psychological affliction. A sense of inferiority that suddenly comes whenever you want to stand up to preach the gospel. Whereas you never fear people's face when you are discussing business. You never thought that if you express your opinion about a newspaper report that it was going to be any problem. But the moment you are about to talk something about the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, something grip you inside. As if, mm -mm. As if it's something to be ashamed of. That's why Paul was declaring in the book of Romans that we read, he said, I am not, what? Ashamed of the gospel. Do you know that even though you are a teacher, teaching your students, secondary school students, who by all means will listen to you at any time because you are the one teaching them geography. But do you know that any time you now want to switch over from talking geography and you now want to talk Jesus? Even though you are a teacher who is very bold, what do you suddenly discover? A sense of shame as if, if I do this now, these students may think, these students may think, it's an affliction that the devil sets to hinder the gospel. And why did he do so? Because he knows very well what is the power that could be released when the gospel is preached in any place, to any man, in any community. So the first thing that we need to first quickly deal with as we begin to look at the power of the gospel is for me to first establish with you that the sense of shame does not make the gospel inferior. 
Hallelujah. Let me inform you that the gospel is not inferior. And there is no philosophy, there is no theory, there is no so called gospel that is superior to the gospel. It is only but a black veil. Maybe I should go forward to tell you. Do you know it is part of that shame that we make you, for example, to freely and boldly quote books of philosophers and other authors as a show that you are brilliant and you are very intellectual. But when you will quote what Jesus Christ says over a matter, how do you do it? You feel apologetic. Am I right? You will not see yourself quoting from the scriptures as boldly as we have quoted on certain people. As if there was any book that anybody has written on earth that is superior to the work that God himself had delivered unto his servants by the Holy Ghost. Something makes us ashamed as if we can only refer to the word of God in a limited sense. As if if we will ever quote anything around the gospel, we must only do it with a sense of inferiority. So sometimes because of that same shame, several preachers think it is a great achievement that they preach so much, quote many, many, many philosophers. Some are not even believers. They think that when they quote such, they are impressing their audience with a level of intellectualism. Some are so ashamed that they will talk and talk and talk and talk. And if at all they will refer to scriptures, they will do so in passing. They will not make it the center reference out of which every discussion emanates. I would like to suggest to you that it's a battle against the gospel. And the battle is not because the gospel is inferior. Is because the prince of this world, having known the power that the gospel carries and the effect it will have on his kingdom, it quickly operates for you to have a defeatist attitude right in your mind ever before you, you preach. But tonight, what is the power of the gospel? Let me read. I'll just read this Timothy before I return to Romans. And if I have space, I will refer you to Corinthians. He said, But be you partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Who has saved us and called us with an holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his purpose, his own purpose and grace. Which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. 
but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light. Through what? Through the gospel. Now, what does the gospel do? The gospel brings to light. The gospel brings out in the open the great work that God has accomplished but that need to be made manifest among men. Life and immortality is only brought to light when the gospel is preached. When the gospel is released, the power of darkness and the power of death is dismantled and men can come to life and men can experience immortality even in their lives. And so the first thing that I saw Paul saying to Timothy, don't be ashamed. Don't be intimidated. Don't accept inferiority for preaching the gospel. Don't accept as if if we keep speaking the gospel no matter how monotonous it appears as if we are simpleton or as if we are simplistic. Don't accept that blackmail. So let's return now. What was the persuasion of Brother Paul? Brother Paul said as much as in me is, I'm back in Romans chapter 1 now, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Why? Why? Because I am not ashamed of what? Of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God Unto salvation. Now, will anybody help me read that verse 16? From Good News Bible, Good News Bible, or Living Bible, Old Living Bible. Does anybody have good news in this, uh, in this meeting tonight? Any good news? I am not ashamed. Wait, sir. Wait, wait. I'm coming. What are you reading, brother? You are not reading good news. I have complete confidence. Let me hear you now. I have complete confidence in the gospel. It is God's power to save all who believe. The Jews and then the Greeks. Thank you very much. Where is the Living Bible? Old Living Bible. I am not ashamed. Yes. Wait, I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. Yes, it is God's powerful method. It is God's powerful method of bringing all who believe it to heaven. Brothers, the only means by which God brings men out of darkness unto heaven is the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for changing men. Please listen. 
I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. To the Jew first and also even to the Greeks. Before I go to verse 17, I want you to pause and please examine the issues we are raising here. I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God. What are we calling the gospel in that verse? Is the power of God. Brothers, there are little, little things that I feel we should talk about tonight as we pray together on this. Do you know that many, many times some of us we are honestly looking for power. And somehow, something makes us to separate the power of the Holy Ghost from the power of the Gospel. I don't know whether you are hearing me at all. Somehow in our minds, we think that the power of the Holy Spirit, when they said, the power of the Holy Spirit is upon me. We are tempted to think that there is something different that the Holy Ghost is going to do to manifest power outside the Word of God. So sometimes I've been in meetings where a preacher would just think that all this Bible we are reading, all this Bible we are reading, we are wasting time. Let us do ministration. Say, so please close your Bible now. We are not here for all those uh, messages. We are not here for the Word of God. We are here now for demonstration. Power. And I'm sitting down there listening and wanting to touch what that power is. If we remove the matter of emotionality, if we are not carried away just by the fact that he has created a frenzy atmosphere that everybody is confused, I have not really seen any power that is not based on the gospel. Actually, when the Bible said in Acts chapter 4, when the disciples prayed that they would be filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Bible said the place where they prayed shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. If you went to read the word of God, right in that chapter from verse 31 down, you will notice that the parameters that they described of when they were filled with the Holy Ghost was that, let's read it, let's read it, so that you can follow me. I am saying all of this because in going forth, I want you to know that the power of the Holy Spirit that will rest upon your life will give you power only to preach what? The gospel. If I have space and were to tell testimonies, testimonies of when the power of the gospel was released upon people's lives in my very eyes. There's nothing like it. People have been violently saved and violently converted because the power of the word of God came upon their lives. 
And yet I know that that power that is embedded in the gospel is only activated when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Are you there in Acts chapter 4? I want you to see from verse 31. I just read. And when they had prayed, the place was shaking where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake what? What did they speak? They spoke the word of God with what? Boldness. Not with shame. Not with inferiority. Now go on. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with what? Great power gave the apostles what? Witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. The mistake we made when we started looking for the Holy Ghost is that we thought that when a man has received power, he will just be gyrating and he will be just be doing certain things that is totally unconnected with the consistent testimony and the witness of the word of God. So sometimes we close our Bible and say, oh God, come down, come down, manifest your power, manifest your power. We were shaking our head like that. We were not expecting that when the power comes, what the power will energize, what the power will release, it will release the gospel in its great effect. That when we speak a word, the power of the Holy Spirit will drive it as if you are driving a nail into a wood. It never occurred to us that when the power of the Holy Ghost settles on a man's life, it becomes the anointing that grants the unction for the word of God to have effect on the ears of men. The black man of the gospel is the quiet separation in our mind that there is difference between the gospel and the power of God. There is a quiet dichotomy in our heart that makes us to feel that, okay, uh, they have finished the gospel now. Let's now face power. How many of you have been in that situation? Let me see your hand up. Let me be sure. Let me see your hand. Wave it properly. That's good. It's okay. We are just being honest. I was like that. I was like that. I actually thought that when I finished preaching the word of God, that the word of God was not sufficient to perform all the miracles. So I thought that, let's leave the word of God, then let's come and do something. But, severally the Lord continued to show me, no, no, when my power comes upon you, I give you liberty to express the gospel in his power. Excuse me, brothers and sisters. When the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, what will you be? You'll be witnesses of me. When the Holy Ghost will come upon you, it will teach you all things. And you will witness of me. And the Holy Ghost also will witness. That's what Jesus Christ said. So, 
tonight may I first establish that the gospel is the power of God. I want you to believe this. I'm trusting God that you will go from here. I'm going to establish that quickly before I, I, I leave you to pray. I'm trusting God that we will go from here with complete confidence in the gospel. He said, I have complete confidence in what? In the gospel. It's a pity that we could be preachers and our confidence in the gospel is very weak. I see it all the time. I see that something in us does not have confidence in the gospel. We have confidence in something else. Something tells us that if you just preach the gospel, it's not enough. We are tempted to look for something else. But because God is saying, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, unto all the nations, for a witness. For us to be able to carry the gospel and go to every extent to which we want to see the power of God at work. We must develop deep in our hearts confidence in the gospel. Do you follow me to that point? Can I go on? Praise the Lord. So you see, Brother Paul said, I am coming to you people in Rome also. Because for me, the gospel is God's powerful method for changing men. Several years ago, a family had very, very notorious son. He has really troubled them. Broken their hearts. And they've tried everything they know how to try. I don't know how I got to know and they, they informed me that this boy is very wayward, this, that, 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 that. And I said, please send him to me. Let me, let me chat with him. And when they were sending the young man to me, the Holy Spirit simply told me, the only solution to this boy's problem is what? You just give him the gospel. In my mind, I said, but he is very notorious to say, and so that, and so what? And we, he came. And as I shared the word of God with him, I have seen the power of the gospel for changing men. Just like that. It's like tongue. We didn't speak for an hour when I saw a transformation in his life that you couldn't imagine. He went back home. I had not told the parents that we have talked. But in the next several days, they saw a very changed child. What he never did for them before, he was doing. They were watching him for days. Then they asked me, what did you do to him? 
What did you do to him? I said, the gospel. You know what they did? Then they were telling the story to all their friends. If you have any notorious boy, (laughs) send him to Brother Billy. They misunderstood everything. They thought I had a way of dealing with notorious people. They did not know that the only weapon, the power that changes men, was the word of God. Praise the Lord. If I had time, I would have caught some persons up here whom nobody could tame. Who themselves were reckless. And they were moving dangerously when they had accident with the word of God. <laughs> they never survived it. The power of the gospel, when it is released, it changes men. It subdues sinner. I must have told you how I was struggling to separate a husband and wife. And I almost lost my finger. And I was going back to show God because I thought, blessed are the peacemaker. For they shall be called the son of God. I was going to show God how my hand was wounded where I was. I was trying to separate a man and his wife. They are fighting very violently and the, the woman bites me with finger. With her teeth. So I was saying, oh God, you know, this is, this is the work of peacemaker. The, Lord, <laughs> the Holy Spirit said, if they had broken your head today, it would have been your fault. I said, ah, does it mean that when they are fighting in my neighborhood, I should not go and separate them and say, that's not what I sent you to do. Friends, let me inform you. Sometimes you are doing many things that are useless. Sometimes you are using your human words to talk and say, brother, you know, you're educated, don't fight, you know. How do you expect uh, people to be looking at you that you are fighting your wife? It's no good. Go and settle. All of those is useless. Because it has no power to change them. So I said, Lord, what do you expect me to do? He said, what did I give you to change me? Who told you that your advice can change people? Who told you that your human wisdom can help them? Go and give that woman the gospel. I only waited for the money to break. By the time it was money, I walked up to that house. The woman was still like this. I said, where's, where's your guy? I said, you know, don't talk to me about he has gone. I said, do you want peace? She said, where will I get peace when I marry a useless non-entity, a man like this? Ah. But this time, I wasn't going to say, you know, and it's like that, and if you keep fighting, things will be wrong, and you know. No. I brought out the word of God. As I began to describe, and I want to tell you that the gospel can be preached from any part of the word of God. Every Bible story was written to point to Jesus. I just reached out to the Bible and I said, A new heart will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. I will take away from you the heart of stone. The woman said, what do you mean? 
I said actually this problem is a heart problem. She adjusted her chair. Say, how do you mean? I say, it's a heart problem. And unless there is a heart surgery, this problem will not be solved. Though. See how many years you have married your husband. You have been fighting. He said, yes, the man will not change. I said, by quarreling, as he changed, he said, no. I said, that's what we are talking about. I said, for the person to change, God said, there's something in you that is a stony heart. When I describe the stony heart, if I took that away from the Old Testament and I bring it to the New Testament, what is the stony heart? It's the old man, Mr. Flesh, and the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. I have not finished reading all that. I said, hey, that is my heart. That is my heart. Aha. The gospel. I said, but God wants to do a miracle today. He said, I will take away from you the heart of stone. We cannot improve it. We cannot change it. The heart of mine is desperately wicked. It is too sick to be healed. I said, look at how many times you yourself you have been praying that something will change your heart. As it changes, he said, no. I thought that that was how I was born. I said, that's true. By the time I had finished, she said, how can God remove this stony heart from me? I said, that's what he said he will do now. That was why Jesus Christ actually came in order to take away that stony heart, he took it to Calvary. So that he can give you his own heart. Do you remember that that Bible says, and a new heart will I give you? He said, I want it, I want it. I said, knee down now. It was like a magic. Friends, I have seen the power of the gospel. I have seen what the gospel can do. I had just finished praying and as if God, I wouldn't say as if, actually God did a miracle. Something changed. Her countenance immediately changed. I didn't tell her to do anything. She stood up. She rearranged the house. She swept the rooms. She carried out all the clothes, dirty clothes of her husband. She washed it. You know, the man got annoyed and left around 6 a.m. By the time he was coming back, food was on the table for him. And this woman came and knelt down and said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The problem is not you, it's me. It was the heart I had. But God has removed that heart. <laughs> The, the man thought she was just cajoling him. The first day passed. And you know what I did immediately? The good news Bible that I carried. She said, I don't have Bible. I said, be reading this. She sat with that good news and was reading it copiously. By the time the man watched his wife two days, three days, she came across my house and said, Mr. Connie, I said, yes. What did you do to my wife? What did you do to my wife? I said, like how? He said, ah, since I came back. She washed the house. She did everything. She knelt down. My food was ready. The only thing she's interested in now is that she's reading her Bible. If you are doing this to people's wives, it will be wonderful.
You see, the gospel solves solves problems that courts can never resolve. You know, I tell you, and there are high court judges here which I highly respect, and because they are brothers, and I thank God for your work, but I do not envy them. Do you know why? The high court judge has power to convict and even to condemn. But they don't have power to convert. I am not a learned man. When learned men are speaking, I am completely unlearned. But God, having committed to my hand the gospel, He has given us power that changes men, converts them inside out the gospel. How I wish you will put all your strength in preaching the gospel. How I wish every teacher who is struggling with the misbehavior of students, how I wish you will stop complaining. How I wish you will commit yourself unto preaching the gospel. Some say, well, we are preaching to them, they don't hear. We are preaching to them, they don't hear. Let me inform you. Sincerely speaking, most of what you call preaching is ordinary abuse. If I tape your message and I ask you to listen to it, you yourself you will know you have not preached the gospel that changes men. Sometimes you tell someone and say, Yes. The way you are behaving like this, you will go to hell. Look, when you get to hell, kai, 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 you will burn like kerosene. As you are going up and down like this, we are telling you, we are telling you, we are only warning you, you will perish. Is that the gospel? That is useless threats. Threatening sinners, even with hell, without showing them the man of Calvary, is not the gospel. Are you hearing me at all? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, unto everyone. Who believes it? Everyone who believes it. You know, when I come to that scripture, I say, Everyone, oh, my heart was excited. I said, Yeah. The gospel is the only powerful means that God had given for changing and for bringing and preparing men for heaven. Everyone. When we were students, we had a professor who was also a womanizer. Very reckless man. And he had asked two two of our sisters to come and see him at odd hours, something like 7 p.m. Such men are of easy virtue. They can sleep with the girls in their office. And usually in our fellowship then, we have so much cooperation 
if a sister is being victimized, all of us will gather and we pray. And this guy said, the prof said I must come. We said, okay. Go, but don't go alone. When you are going, carry tracts. Tracts. If somebody's face is too fearful to you, give him a tract. So when this girl got in, say, good evening, sir. You know, the man stood up like, eh, 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 you know. The girl said, excuse me. I want to tell you that you need to receive Jesus Christ. <laughs> the man was fused and said, You are talking to me, a whole prof. No girl has ever dared me on this campus. And the sister passes there and says, Well, it's not a matter of daring you. I just feel I have an obligation to tell you that you need Jesus. And that without Christ in your life, you will be in crisis. The man was so annoyed that the girl preached to him. You know what the sister did? Just drop a tract on his table and say, well, you might want to read this. And she left. The prof was annoyed. He was walking up and down in the street and said, me? That girl, I will show her that. You know? You know? And as he was doing like that, I don't know what happened to him. He, he just said, let me even read the useless thing the girl brought. <laughs> you know what was in that tract? Oh fool. <laughs> what does he profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Oh fool. That's how he said, oh fool. <laughs> he was reading it, he was reading it, he was reading it. The more he was reading, the more he realized that he was the fool. Before you know it, he went and sat in his chair under conviction. What do I do? But you know the tract also said, and in case you want to experience the peace of God in your life, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, he has paid the price. If you will kneel down where you are, that's our professor knelt down by his chair and confessed his sin and he was converted. Now, you see, how did I get to know about this? Once the gospel has affected him, he became hungry for the truth. He started asking, I want to know more of this. Do you have more tracts for me? That's how we knew. We were students. He was professor. Are you hearing me? But the gospel in the mouth of a mere student makes him a senior to a professor who has not repented. You see, unfortunately, because you do not know the power of what you carry, you are tempted to hide it. I'm not asking you to be rude. I'm not asking you to go and be abusing your senior lecturers. But I want you to know that as small as you are, with the gospel in your mouth, you carry the power of God. There's something in your hand that can convict a man and bring him on his knees. Professor became our convert. Bible study, he will sit down. He said, Bile, you know I don't know this thing. Explain to me. Explain to me. Praise the Lord. The gospel. The gospel is the power of God 
unto salvation. Unto everyone that does what? That believes. Everyone. First to the Jews and then to the Greeks. What he meant is that to the religious and to the irreligious. To the educated and to those who are not learned. The gospel has the same effect whenever it is preached. It is what? The power of God. Let me inform you. The gospel is not an explanation. The gospel is not an advice. The gospel is not even an ordinary exhortation. The gospel, inside it, it carries the dynamite of God. The gospel carries what breaks the backbone of Satan over any man. The gospel. Friends, did you see how Professor Intentily gave you his testimony? Eh? Prof, how many PhDs do you have? Eh? Baba has two PhDs. He's a theologian by excellence. He didn't tell you all the things he had gone through. How cool a professor of two PhDs. How could he fall down on his knees crying? Only the gospel does that. Are you hearing me? When you preach the gospel, nobody cares whether you went to school or you didn't go to school. What you are confronting them with is bigger than them. Are you hearing me? The gospel. The gospel is universal in saving souls. Hear me please. The gospel will save a big man as well as a young man. The gospel has power to convict the white and the black. Praise the Lord. Are we together? I believe in the power of the gospel because whether you are a Jew or you are a Greek, it is God's powerful method for changing men and for taking them to heaven. Time will fail us to explain to you that the gospel, but now, even though time will fail me, but I must say this, before I conclude. Go with me to verse 17. For therein, that is, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall do what? Shall live by faith. It is only in the gospel that God's way of making men righteous is actually revealed. Many people are looking for means and ways of making their lives right with God. But only in the gospel can they discover what has God set as his means of making men right with himself. For the just shall do what? Shall live by faith. Permit me to now ask you to conclude with me First Corinthians. You see, these passages we are reading and turning around is simply because one of the things I sense God wants to help us to accomplish in MLR this year is to release 
a company of men and women equipped with the power of the Holy Spirit bearing about the precious seed of the gospel. And when they go and they come back, they will come back with sheep. You are coming back with great harvests. In the name of Jesus Christ. You are going to see the glory of God. You will see the glory of God. You will see what the gospel. Now I want to point something to you so that in our prayer together tonight, we might pray completely with understanding. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 1. In verse 17, Paul was giving a testimony, he said, For Christ did what? Sent me not to baptize, but to preach what? The gospel. I was wondering why Paul said God did not send him to baptize. Was baptism not part of what Jesus told his disciples to do? But let me inform you that baptism can only be the result, the celebration of the victory of the gospel in the lives of people. If you go about baptizing people to whom you have not preached the gospel, what have you done to them? What have you done to them? You have just given them a bath. How many of you were baptized and you never heard the gospel? Let me see your hand up. We were many. Baptism, it doesn't say Can I ask you, is it the barrier that kills a man? I, I thought you would answer me quickly. You know, it looks absurd. You don't bury a man who has not died. If you carry a man who is not dead and say, we will bury you, we will bury you. You know you will kick and fight you terribly. How many people are baptized who have never died? How do you bury a man who has not died? Even though when men have received the gospel and they have repented, we shall baptize them as a, 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 a demonstration of what has happened. Are we together? But Christ did not send us primarily to do what? To baptize. What did he send us to do? Paul said he has sent me to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words. Let the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness. But unto us which are saved, what is it? It is the power of God. The power of God. But I want you to now follow me to a point in this passage and then I will leave it. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? And where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God 
by the foolishness of preaching. To do what? To save them that believe. Now, listen. For the Jews, they require a sign. And the Greeks, they seek after wisdom. But what did we do? What do we do? We preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews, a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. I want to say something before I pray with you tonight. I realize, and I want to say it very, very humbly, Sometimes we are tempted that people will by wisdom and by much understanding people will know God. I have suffered that kind of calamity. Sometimes when I have met people that I thought are very intellectual I mistakenly become intellectual. Eh? Instead of preaching the simple gospel, then I will go into analysis. And as I go into analytical things, I've engaged their intellect. And then they are saying, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's brilliant. That's brilliant argument. Yes. Uh, that's, that's logical. That's logical. That's logical. When I finish all of those intellectualism, they only give me their hand and say, well, uh, Billy, I, I think you are brilliant. You should, you should not have been a preacher. <laughs> uh, you should not have been a preacher. You are wasting your time. You are too brilliant for that kind of thing you are doing. They give me their commendation, but their souls are condemned. What is my use? So I realized that it takes a different commitment to the gospel not to be tempted. It's not that we are not brilliant. Brothers and sisters, it's not that we are not brilliant. It's not that we could not engage in higher arguments. But men will not be saved by intellectual analysis. The Bible says, since men will not know God by wisdom, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that does what? That believe. I realize that it takes a deep conviction in our spirit to know that the weapon that saves men is the preaching of Christ and Him crucified. Sometimes it could be very juicy to delve into the realm of, of intellectualism. Sometimes it can be very exciting that you enter into what they call the etymology of words. Only Brother Peak understands all of that. When you take a word and you begin to analyze it and you draw it as if you are dissecting it. And then you are saying, hmm, hmm, what? That's great. Hmm. Excuse me. All those gesticulations. Does he save them? If a man is highly impressed with my presentation and he was not convicted, what have I gained? So I saw Paul say, look, I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him. What? I found that, sir, those of you that are brilliant, 
It takes a different determination to preach the gospel in a simplicity. Those of you that are very, 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 very philosophical in your analytical minds. Sometimes I'm sitting there and I'm listening to very brilliant brothers. When they finish preaching, with all the analysis, if I want to greet them, I say, oh, that's a very brilliant message. Very brilliant message. They think I'm greeting them. <laughs> they don't know that I'm simply telling them that you missed the point. You missed the point. Any message that does not reach for the heart of men is a misfire. So Brother Paul said, the Jews, they are requiring sign. Can somebody who has message, message translation, is there any message version here today? Are you there? Stand up and read for me with a very loud voice. I'd like you to read verse 22, verse 23, and verse 24. Can you see that? Moses, stand up and read it again. I normally enjoy his voice. Read it again. Jews, they clamor for miraculous demonstration. And let me tell you, what has confused many of us, you think that people, because they are looking for miraculous signs, as if without miracle, the gospel is not authentic. Say, black man. May I inform you that all the miracles that was recorded in the ministry of Paul did not come because he preached miracles. How did they come? He preached Christ and him crucified. It is not science that authenticates the word of God. The word of God is authentic. Science only follow it, confirming it. Are you with me? So go on reading. Start again, sir. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. You see, how many people have told you quietly sometimes, part of my persecution in this land is that people thought that the kind of preaching we preach is anti-miracle. For many years, we said, if you keep listening to Black Billy like that, you will be poor. They preach poverty. Let me ask you, am I poor? Eh? And is Braden is poor? Let me ask you, do you do you see poverty on my face? Why do people think that except they preach money, they will not have money? Is because of the same blackmail of the gospel. You see, when you preach Christ, now I want him to I want him to finish reading it so that you can hear it from the Bible. Go on, read it, sir. Uh-huh. 
is God's ultimate miracle. Is all in all in one. When we preach Christ and Him crucified, we are bringing you into ultimate miracle. Ultimate miracle. Oh, I'm talking about ultimate miracle. You see, when you begin to live in the miraculous, miracles become normal. You can't understand what I'm talking about. If you know the kind of miracles that we experience every time, such that we don't even know where to start giving the testimony, it's normal. If it's the miracle of provision, it's normal. If it is the miracle of healing, it is a normal, it is so normal. Normal. But you see, because the Jews, and there are many Jews in this meeting. Amen. Who clamor for miraculous signs as if that is what authenticates the world. And the Greeks, they are clamoring for philosophical wisdom. But the Paul said, we, we, we go right on preaching Christ and Him crucified. And to the Jews, they think this is anti-miracle. Brad Tewase was not here now to sing that song. That one of the preachers said, give me five naira. And, no, he said, stone me with five naira. And expect a miracle. That's a man of God preaching when he needed money. He said, <laughs> I need the was to come and sing that song to you. <laughs> Expect a miracle, stormy with Naira. Expect a miracle, stormy with Naira. Expect a miracle, stormy with Naira. Expect a miracle. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> you wonder why we are so funny like this. <laughs> Look, was that not what people thought that made when a man of God is preaching, you see people coming out to come and throw offering at him? Because they have told them that when you do that, your miracle is on the way. Aberrations that discredit the gospel. Moses, please read it one more time and then I'll leave it. 22. They pass it off as absurd. Uh -huh. Yes. Amen. 
That's what it is. And I want to now inform you that the power of the gospel brings you the ultimate miracle. Ultimate miracle. I wish my friends, I wish they would just sit down. But you know, I found that it's an addiction. When you are addicted to looking for signs, you never get satisfied. Even when you are not getting the signs, you will set up end signs for signs. Why are we restating this tonight? I want you to know that there will be uncountable miracles as we preach the gospel. I want you to know that. I want you to know that we don't even have to divert from preaching the gospel to pursue science. Science will follow us as we go. Because we have not always had time so that people will come and tell the stories of what happened when they read a book or when they listened to a message or when they were listening to, to, to a DVD. How the Lord Raise them from their, from their beds. Because we don't have space of telling all that stories. It might make some of you to think that there are no miracles. There are miracles every time the word of God goes forth. The word of God has power to bring to pass everything in the will of God concerning you. How we were doing teacher summit in Ibadan some few years ago. And a sister came all the way from Ilori because she heard that I would be there. And she was begging that I need to talk to you. I said, for what? I don't have time. He said, I wanted to come and tell you. I told God that I must come and tell you because you may not know what is happening. I said, what was it? And she went on to tell me the story of how she had been bedridden. And even doctors have come around and they have given her up. Actually, they said they would discharge her to go home. Because the case is hopeless. But while she was lying down, there was this small book, The Resurrection and Life is Here. Do you remember that small book? It was a follow-up of one MLR meeting that became a small booklet. I think the title now is When He Is Come. <laughs> when He Comes. That's the new title, the small book. She said she picked it and was reading it casually. But as she was reading, because we were talking about the value of dry bones, how bones came together, how tendron were joined to another, and that in the book we simply wrote and said, Whatever your situation is, even if your bone has been dry for too long, this bone shall live again. I wasn't there to lay hands. She was just reading. She said, as she read, something snapped in her heart. She said, it's true. And she felt the presence of the Lord who said, I am the resurrection and the life. And I see something lifted her up from there. That's how she stood up. To the surprise of everybody. And she walked out of that place. 
And when she has now worked out and she finds that her life is now, everything is perfect way. She now started looking for the address of the book. And they asking, where can? And so I said, they are doing teacher summit in Ibada. She said she must come to testify what God has done. We said, thank you, sister. God bless you. But we don't have time for that because we are preaching. We, we need to finish our meeting. To us, it was not enough to take photographs. It was not enough for us to stop a very critical instruction about Christ. We glorify God for what He does because it belongs to Him. Don't allow the blackmail that the devil is casting on the gospel to make you think less of the power of the word of God that you carry. He is the ultimate miracle. Hallelujah. But then, what do I want to conclude with you over? It is that Paul said, I am not ashamed. I am ready as much as in me is to preach to those of you in Rome also. He told Timothy, Thou Timothy, be thou not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord and of me, his prisoner. But be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. I want to ask you tonight. The gospel, properly preached, fully preached, is the power of God. And when the Holy Ghost will come upon your life, it has only come to make you a more effective witness of the gospel. Praise the Lord. And when the anointing of the Holy Spirit will be released upon your life, and God will be doing signs and wonders, people will be jumping up. Those that have been sitting on the wheelchair, they will stand up and be walking. And it is it, not going to be that you are the one stretching their leg. They will just walk because they have heard the gospel. Don't let it divert you. Can you go on preaching the gospel? Will you? Will you pray and say, God, give me complete confidence in the gospel? That I will never be ashamed whether I'm in the office or I'm in the market. Whether I'm in a taxi or I am just encountering people. Whether I am meeting superiors or I am meeting my junior colleagues. Lord, let me not be ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is God's greatest equipping that he has put in our hands. We are describing the gospel today first for you to know that it is the power of God. But the gospel that you know that you did not preach will not affect men. Am I right? The gospel that is not properly preached will, will be dormant. It will not change men. So as we pray together tonight, my first request, and there are three requests I'm putting to you, the first request I want you to check. Have you received the gospel? Is the gospel effectively working in your life? When the gospel has come into a man's life, it makes him a living witness of what the gospel can do. God does not give you a gospel that is theoretical, to you that is not real in your life. When the gospel comes into your life, it will make you a witness. You yourself, by life, you will have something to say. Say, ah, it has affected me. It has changed me. It has healed me. It has set me free. Every time we are talking and I say, ah, you don't know where I come from? 
when I meet brothers that are struggling, say, eh, ancestral spirit, eh, say, eh, demons will not let you sleep in the night, eh, eh, where your umbilical cord was buried. And I tell them, I say, I ah, know. If any man be in Christ, is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. They look at me and say, Brother, ah, it's not simple like that. So I say, how? how? What do you mean? By the time I tell them, I say, let me tell you where I come from. Let me tell you that if they bury umbilical cord somewhere under the shrine, my own was, was have been buried double. If anybody made cuttings on your head, how many uncountable cuttings was on this head? It was cut every year. If anybody drank concussion, did you start drinking concussion since you were born? We drank concussion since we were in the womb. But when the gospel came to us, all of that at once finished. I'm a living witness of the victory of Jesus Christ. I'm a living witness of his healing. When he said, by his stripes, you are healed. We are living witness. The gospel has done that. The gospel must make you a witness. When it has entered your life, you will be the living witness of what you are preaching. This night, it will, it will not be right for me to presume and say, well, since you are happy with me, it's all right. No. Being happy with a preacher does not take you to heaven. Praise the Lord. What is it? The gospel received in your heart whereby we stand and by which we have been saved if you hold fast unto the words that you have heard. That's what gives you a space among the saints. This night, could it be that you have been running again up and down? And Jesus said, Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Come to me. In the afternoon, we came to the point where we noticed that because he was the one that died for our sins, buried, and rose again for us, and he appeared to men. All those are the basic ingredients, the content of the gospel. Because he died for our sins, sin no longer has dominion over you. And this night, as you step to receive him, to receive the gospel, to believe him. The Bible says it is God's powerful method of changing every man that believes. Don't let me hear you say, my own case is difficult. No, no, no. Don't say that. Don't say that. Let me not hear you say, well, I don't think anything can change my case. That's not true. That's not true. He who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he who dismantled the power of darkness, how far did you go? You have not yet gone to hell yet. Are you already inside hell? Not yet. Even those that Satan had already put in hell, when Jesus went there, he, he led captivity captive. How much less yourself? You will be free tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. Did anybody say that over his dead body, will you make it in life? Was there a curse that anybody placed on your life? Do you know that the reason why Jesus was crucified? The Bible says, Cursed be he that hangeth upon a tree. Having been crucified, no curse can have any effect on you if you believe. That's why when people got annoyed with me in those days and they were cursing me, you know what I just did? I just put my neck like this. And I'm saying, Amen. Amen. That one made them more annoyed. They said, 
What are you talking about? We are causing you are saying amen. I say yes, you are blessing me. Because how can you cause a man whom God has not caused? You don't know that at Calvary, every cause was nullified. You can't cause me. Friend, what did I say you cannot do? Can't cause me. In fact, if you cause me, you have only blessed me. You have only promoted me twice. If you say, you will die tomorrow, I will just say thank you very much. It means I will live much more than tomorrow. That does not even need prayer. You don't, I don't even need to say, come and help me break a course. Come and help me break a course. Which course? Is there any course that the cross of Jesus Christ did not cross? There's nothing like that. Even tonight, my friends, if you believe the gospel, and I want you to deliberately believe the gospel, I want you to look at the man of Calvary. It is so that you may be a partaker of the heavenly inheritance that he died. Friends, if you are not free from the kingdom of darkness, let me tell you, it's a double cheating. Because your price was already paid. Even Satan is surprised that you are still available for him to oppress. But since you didn't know, he said he better doesn't, don't let him know. Let him not know. But as the light of the gospel shines on you today, you will walk out in liberty in the name of Jesus Christ. We are going to pray my first request of you. And I don't want you to presume, have you received the gospel? Have you received the gospel, the full gospel? The gospel that saves, the gospel that heals, the gospel that delivers. The gospel that empowers. The gospel that places you on the pedestal of glory. And I say it happens instant. Out of the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of his dear son. You can have that tonight. And if, by the grace of God, you have gone round, you have tried, you are even using some concussion, maybe you are sitting here like a brother, I did the of those years. Where did the now? Rajari, are you here? Oh, he needs to tell you what the gospel did to him. He was in church, he was in the choir with a uh, Undi under the pint. <laughs> ah. And the word of God was coming. And I didn't know he was sitting there. And the spirit of God, the way he normally uses me. I just turned to his direction and said, And you may be there wearing charm under your pints. Then he said, Ha! Did anybody tell him? Did anybody tell him? All those things cannot save you. Come to Jesus. He's the one that settled your case. I saw a man who trem he trembled out of the meeting. He said, he said, I'm just coming from the village. And I said, go and bring it. Adedibu, have you been alright since that time? Praise God. How many years now? Eh? 34 years. I'm talking to you about evidence of the gospel. The evidence of the gospel. Everywhere we have preached this gospel, we have seen enduring results. Supernatural healings. The things that my brother was going up and down looking for and going from one Babalawu to another. After that day, when he received the gospel, it finished. It's been finished ever since. We are, we are not conducting deliverance every week. The only thing that kept me with him for five months was to get him filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that was the only thing. 
But this man has been running everywhere. The gospel. Please, friends, if you are sitting in this meeting today, it doesn't matter how many dreams you have been having. Maybe you have been seeing masquerades in your dreams. Stop looking at masquerades. Look at Jesus. Look and live. My brother, look and live. My sister, look and live. And hear him say, come to me. Whosoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. What it means is that your condition can never be beyond his hand. Your situation can never be so hopeless that I say, well, I can't help you. No. You are here in this meeting. Whatever God did to bring you here, this will be the end of your problem. The Bible says Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone who believes. When you come to Christ, you have come to the end of your search. When you come to Jesus Christ, you have come to the end of your struggle. And this night, it is rich unto all. Anybody who will call on the name of the Lord, the Bible said, they shall be saved. Permit me to ask you to stand up while we pray together. Those of you that have received the gospel, celebrate the gospel. Thank God for your deliverance if you have. Those of you that, yes, you say, but I thought I received but I've been running up and down. I'm struggling. If you look at our brothers, the professor's testimony, look at what God had to do for him. Maybe this night the Lord is calling you. I say, yes, you've not been victorious. You've been living up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. You've been struggling. Because when the gospel that you received said you have to struggle, Maybe the gospel you receive says you have to fast it out. But this night God is saying, come to me. I will give you rest. Tonight can be the end of that. We can bury that problem here. At the foot of the cross tonight. The full gospel is available. You don't need to pay for it. It's free. It's free. Thank you. Thank you. Bring it to the cross. Lay it down and say, Father, this problem has been my challenge. I have struggled with this for years. You may think it's an addiction, it's a yoke. But Jesus, by his power, by his authority, by his anointing, he breaks yokes. He breaks yokes. The gospel is the power of God to everyone that believes. Everyone. To the Jew and even to the Greek. Whatever you are, wherever you are coming from, whatever had been your story, Jesus Christ stands in our midst tonight. Say, For your sake I went to the cross. For your sake I died. For your sake I was buried. I went down. So that those things that are under the underneath the earth might come under the subjection of the word of God. Let me inform you tonight. If anybody say he has buried your destiny in the grave, Jesus went down to break it. He led captivity captive. I want God to make you the evidence, evidence of the gospel. Have you been going about with some sickness? They told you that if you don't drink this concussion, if you don't go to that place, some of you, you are under the constant oppression of some prophets. They are prophesying to you every time. You are spending half of your salary every time. They are saying, Something about you cannot balance. No, 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 no. When he went to Calvary, he finished it all. Jesus paid it all. Friends, those of you that God has blessed with the gospel, 
and you are understanding, begin to celebrate it. Begin to praise God for it. Begin to walk in the liberty of it. But if anything tonight, the Holy Spirit is saying, go to me, go to the cross. Hand over to the man of Calvary. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, we are grateful to you. Father, tonight is, is the night. This is the day the Lord has made. God gave you this particular day for your own. Today is December 6th. And God has ordained that today is your day of deliverance. Today is your day. It will go on record. That that matter is ending tonight. It's ending tonight, yes. As you say to him, Lord Jesus, I have brought everything to you. Just as I am without anyone, plea. Take over, Lord. Take over, Lord. Thank you. If you are in the gallery and you want to come down, please come down quickly. Anywhere you are, the Holy Spirit is saying, tonight is your night. Friend, tonight is the night. And I want you to know that as you come, come with every load. Come with every issue. Come. Come. Oh weary soul, come. I will give you rest. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Is the devil saying you can never be free? Remember that he broke, he broke the yoke. The Bible said, he destroyed the principalities and power. If you are coming, come quickly because we can no longer wait. If you are coming, then you need to run, my friend. You need to move very fast. If you are outside the tent and the Spirit of God is telling you, are you under the tree or you are somewhere around the market? Tonight is your night of deliverance. Come down. Run down, run down. Jesus told Nico, he told Zacchaeus, make haste. For today, salvation, salvation is come to your house. Thank you. If you are coming, you need to move. If you are coming, you must run down now. My friend, if you are coming from the gallery, run down, run down quickly. Thank you. Please make a way for those that are coming. God bless you. Young girl, you say, but I have aborted five times. I want to tell you this day. God is willing. When he sees the blood that was shed, he will forgive you. But he will give you the power to go and sin no more. From this meeting, you are walking into liberty. You will become a witness of the gospel. You will become my witness, the Bible says. And through your life, many more will be brought to the kingdom of God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Lord has seen you. The Lord is watching you. Please come quick, quick. Thank you, dear sister. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, young man. Thank you, young man. And as you are coming, just kneel down. I say, Lord, just as, as I am without one place, but as your blood was shed for me, and now thou bidst me come to thee, O Lord. Of God I come, I come, just as I am without Please come down quickly. Just come, God bless you. Just come down quickly. Today, a heart transplant is taking place. Jesus is doing what a man cannot do. Human advice cannot change your life. The power of the gospel. 
the gospel. The gospel. Ah, 